Enabling the digital economy. Hi, everyone. Um, soon, I think there'll be a slide up saying who we are. Uh, I'm Richard Schwartz from Global Custodian magazine, uh, and I'm moderating the session. Uh, I originally looked a bit smarter, but I had to take my jacket off to get mic'd up and then decided it was more comfortable like this. So, um, The title of the session includes the idea of coming together. So exchange services, innovation meets tradition. But before we get on to that convergence, I think because there's so much discussion about blockchain and DLT and um, those technologies, there are some terms we need to separate and uh, clarify in our own minds what we're talking about and what we're not talking about, or certainly at least in my own mind. Um, so we're going to start unpacking a few of those terms just to, to set the scene. Um, and the first one I, I want to ask about, um, I, actually, do we have the slide for the... Oh, there it is. Okay. So uh, we have Kelly, Tom, and Alex from Digital Asset 6 and Trustology. Uh, we're going to look in parallel at the environment for digital assets and the investment in digital assets and digital uh, ledger technology or distributed ledger technology as a platform. So during the discussion, we're going to kind of keep those two things separate but in parallel. But the first thing is, in all the discussions that I hear about DLT, the word tokenization comes up uh, inevitably, and I'm wondering to start with, is that, can you have one without the other? Can you have, is, is tokenization at the heart of DLT? Uh, and if not, can you, can you have one and not the other? So let's start with Alex. Uh, sure, uh, look, we had tokens for a long time, they're called depository receipts. <laughs> um, I think really what we talk about here is, um, you know, how is distributed ledger different to a normal database? Well, every single transaction is digitally signed. Why is that important? Well, because now you have non-repudiation and integrity in a digital world. So you have a much higher level of assurance that the records are what they say they are. The other thing that's a little bit different is the fact that basically it's a decentralized ledger. What does that mean? It means it's basically auto-reconciling. Yeah. So everyone uh, gets to see the same version of the database, and there's a baked-in protocol that allows us to reconcile any differences automatically so we don't have to do the usual reconciliation game. And the third thing is you can add code to um, the database. And normal databases, they follow what's called CRUD, create, read, update, delete. If you're allowed to make changes to the database, you basically can change the database in whichever way you want to do that. Uh, distributed ledgers are a new type of database where the only way you can change something is if the business logic, and people talk about smart contracts, um, allow it to happen, and everyone validates that. So this is just kind of a slightly different take on a normal database, but there are some key differences as a result of that. So when you put it all together, you say that a record that's digitally signed with a bit of code attached to the data put on a distributed ledger technology is a token. So if we deconstruct what a token is, that's what it is. It's not magic, but it's close to it. Okay. Kelly, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I think that um, you know, the word token suggests, and this is, I don't disagree with anything with that Alex said, but just to allow it to go a l add a little bit more to it. I think the word token um, has taken on a, a meaning in the space of distributed ledger technologies to suggest that it is uh, the creation of something different than exists from today. Um, we don't actually see it that way. Um, at, at the, um, the concept of a, of a token, if I use a different word, is a contract. 
um, where a contract is an expression of the rights and obligation that a party to that contract has the uh, opportunity to exercise or avoid if, they, if, if that's the type of right that they have over the course of the life cycle of uh, security. And that could be short from uh, um, a moment in time when it's just going through a DVP and the purchase and sale is occurring or perhaps a swap or a derivative instrument that has a, a longer lifestyle. But if you, if you put aside the word token and think about it as being a contract, an expression of, um, in, in, uh, in technical and digital form, those terms of a legal agreement across financial services products, a custodial undertaking and the right to safe keep an asset, um, a, a ISDA agreement associated with derivatives, a GMRA associated with repo, it is the expression of those rights and obligations and the, the contract is the embodiment of that in a, in a digital form the results of which are the events that are recorded um, immutably on a distributed ledger. So if you, if you kind of take that word out, I think it sounds more familiar to those of us who have been, like me, for years and years in the in security services and around security services space. The concept itself is not new. The application or the expression of it digitally is. Okay, so that now I'm, I'm it's a little clearer, but I'm a bit more confused about one thing. Um, I understand about the immutability and the, the lack of a need for reconciliation will be music to the ears of lots of people in the securities value chain. But Tom, in my mind, um, so at the moment you invest in shares. You have a share, it's a title. It gives you ownership. The CSD has a golden record of who owns what. Is a token... Can a token provide the same degree of, secu of security about who owns what? Well, let's take a step back. As, a, as an operator of a stock exchange and CCP and CSD, for me, a token is a product in the same way that you have current products today, and you've got a bunch of whiz kids who create those products, and some of them are more complex than others, and some are very simple. If you take that as the background, and then look at the simplest form, Alex mentioned it, is an ADR, is a right to the underlying security, it's effectively a token. What is, is different now is these tokens are being much more clearly differentiated with elements that you can, you can customize, and therefore you create more complex products. So if you take that, and you, there's, there's any number of ways you can, you can change and move those around and, and, and create new, new tokens, new products, um, elements within those products that will react in certain ways based on the contracts attached to it and so on. But at the end of the day, for an operator of an exchange and a, and a CSD, it is an investment product or a payment product, whichever it happens to be, that we work with. Now, to your question, does it have the same rights as, for instance, an underlying share? In most jurisdictions, as far as I'm aware today, the answer is no. The token itself does not. It may be a receipt where you, where you expect to get something that's an underlying security, or it doesn't have an underlying security if it's a so-called native token, and it is a security in its own right, but it is not as I say, in most jurisdictions, um, given the same rights and, and, and uh, a categorization, if you will, of, of a traditional equity or a traditional bond, yet. Well, I think it's a little bit more uh, nuanced than that. So in Delaware recently passed uh, a clarification to the law that says that if the board decides to a fully dematerialize uh, their private securities, and we're talking about private securities, they can. So in the Articles of Association, you say it's a fully dematerialized, uh, and then you can place it on the blockchain. So we're starting to see legal certainty around uh, kind of tokens being the um, prima facie uh, kind of evidence for, uh, for ownership. So I'd, I think it's, it's you're right, a lot of it is not tested. If you go to Germany, you still have 
ultimately uh, have paper, <laughs> um, but many jurisdictions are moving towards full dematerialization. So from an accounting point of view, is there, is, is there a difference in the way these things are represented on, say, the books of a CSD or in an investor's records? It, sure. Well, a couple of things. I'm just, just trying to make this yeah. familiar to people who are... Yeah, who, who are in this in, space, yeah. right? Well, two or three years ago, we still thought of cryptocurrencies and distributed ledger technology as the same thing. Um, so and since that time, they've been decoupled, and people, I think, were universally acknowledged now that one is an asset and one is a technology. So um, when you think about distributed ledger technology and the, the type of accounting or ledger mm -hmm. support, which it is, um, that can be provided, um, if you think about it, distributed ledger technology uh, provides a cryptographically secure environment, uh, provides the ability for different participants who are entitled to see that data to see so in a highly transparent way, um, for the ability uh, for uh, the information to be um, uh, readily available in a, in a real-time basis and to do so in a secure way. These, these characteristics of distributed ledger technology, I think, make themselves um, very uh, beneficial to supporting uh, crypto assets. And so when it, it comes to thinking about how, how this applies from a ledger, from an accounting perspective, I think it matters first to take a little bit of a look at the, the use case, the purpose. Is it... Is it um, uh, wanting to track the inventory and the, the trading inventory and the compliance of a crypto asset. Uh, is it around uh, evaluating and monitoring the transfer of value of these assets, or is it around custody and safekeeping? So I think the reason that we're so supportive of, not to say it because you just asked me to be on your panel, but the reason we're so supportive of what SIX is doing in this space is because it does align, Richard, to those things that we're familiar from in the security services space. I think the reason distributed ledger technology begins to support these types of assets so meaningfully um, is because of a number of things that I think are very familiar to all of us. It can give the ability to have uh, um, at the uh, process of asset creation, um, uh, registration, and recording more streamlined. Uh, it can allow for the simultaneous uh, validation of inventory and transactions down to the account. It can facilitate the transfer of value, um, the transfer of legal title directly between the accounts to have direct and automated payment of entitlements across those accounts and to source the information that you would need from a managerial or a regulatory oversight. But, but two things in all of that is familiar, right, for those of us in security services and it's, it becomes, so why would it be ideal from an accounting or a record perspective for an entity such as a CSD to be picking this up, right? Well, a couple of things. One, and I'm, I'm going to begin by saying I was not around at the time this happened. I'm just reflecting history. Um, but, you know, a crypto asset in many ways has the characteristics right now of bearer securities, bearer bonds. And in the early 80s, these securities went a little bit of the way of the dinosaur because moving them around physically, as it was done back then between banks, turned out to be highly fraught with error, fraud, they get lost, they belong to somebody else. Um, so they're not quite the same, but are the, my point being that a lot of really good reasons why bearer security has moved on from being in the banking realm to being in the central security depository and the registry realm. And since a number of those same characteristics apply to crypto assets, in, in a, admittedly a good way, it's logical that a CSD, a place where they could be immobilized and secured from the type of fraudulent behavior that can arise for he who has it owns it, um, it's, a, it's a logical place for that to be. I would just say, too, that for us and the work we're doing at DA, where um, uh, we are supporting the Australia Stock Exchange, which is I talked about here since we're in their, their home court area, um, the work we're doing there around clearing and settlement for local uh, cash equities is really a platform solution that is just agnostic as to asset. And so many of the things that we're focused on there from a clearing and settlement perspective and the recording of them from a ledger perspective and the onward accounting is, is frankly very similar whether you're talking about a crypto asset, a repo, collateral management, or cash equity. Um, and that's why we think, I mean, to be fair, we think it's, it's, it's very logical, very aligned 
to the services that central security depositories have provided all along. I guess. I, I think to your question, Richard, um, does it look different at a CSD? Now, the reality is if I, if I put an ice in on a water glass, I can, I can book that into the CSD and it makes no difference. Mm -hmm. What is relevant is how does the platform then, in terms of the ledger and, and, and the database and the reconciliation process and so on, how does that work? And today that is very much centralized with a whole bunch of individual reconciliations that go on around that. That, in a distributed ledger environment, would look very different and much more decentralized and gets rid of a lot of the duplication. But the asset itself, the token, could be anything. But also, I mean, look, if the CSD decides to use blockchain as its <clears throat> technology platform, mm -hmm. nothing changes because yeah. nobody tells CSD to use Oracle or Sybase or MongoDB. It's irrelevant. The real battle right now is that something like Ethereum is proving the fact that you don't need the CSD as an organization because there's a new organizational structure, which is a decentralized set of mining nodes that puts the question, do you need CSD? Now, personally, I still think there's a lot of space for the CSD because we've seen that effective governance of a decentralized set of organizations is extremely difficult to do so. But if you project forward, what the CSD does today may not be what they do tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It might become a governance body, mm -hmm. uh, not operating the system because all participants operate, but governing it. And I think, and somebody has to write the smart contracts. Yeah. <laughs> and somebody has to set standards. And, and somebody has to do the issuance, and, and that should probably be an FMI and, and all these sorts of things. E so exactly that. The, you know, the, the structure of the capital market will change. Right, so that was yeah, my next yeah. question. But the you, basic yeah. principles that underlie asset safety and investor protection, you still, need to, you still need to do something to ensure that that's the case. So bearing in mind the point that's been made about the distinction between digital assets and digital ledger technology as a platform, will, you mentioned there may not be a need for CSDs, Will the, the whole value chain and securities still, you know, will you still need that division between institutional investors and stock exchange and clearer and CSD in a, a digital ledger environment? Uh, I think the two questions aren't necessarily linked. They're valid questions, but the our view is very clearly you don't need to, to have separate instances where you run a series of interfaces between them. But then we're in a position where I have the stock exchange, the central counterparty, and the CSD in the same organization. I've got three legal entities, three FMIs. We can make that a lot more efficient by having a single point of entry where one FMI, the second you do that trade, you do the settlement and the booking in a, in a digital wallet, and then it goes into the custody process, whatever is required as a result of the, the contracts around that token. But in theory, you can run it across various interfaces and, and, and interoperable, interoperable blockchains. I'm not sure it's as efficient, mm -hmm. but you know the, the, we'll see what the models look like. Mm -hmm. But you kind of fast forward and, you know, whether you believe in utility tokens or not, doesn't matter, kind of. What does matter is that we now see protocols or networks like Ethereum that have something like 1,500 uh, different tokens issued on it. Single platform operating in a truly geographically distributed way with all the various different exchanges settling in about 10 seconds all trades. We've never had that before. We always have nationalistically bound CSDs because NSD will never uh, trust uh, Americans to operate it. DTCC will never trust Russians to operate it. Uh, so in a world where there is zero trust at a global scale, the very first time we've seen a cross-border solution that allows us to settle globally is this. Therefore, we're now seeing an emergence of a truly global pan-national and securities depository. So no longer do you need to worry about dual listing, you don't need to worry about depository receipts and all that rubbish, frankly. 
because you sweep all of that away. And if you think this is fantasy, it's not. We are seeing this happening right now. They might not be the assets that you value, that's okay. But from a functional point of view, it's working. I think, can I add to yes, that? Is sure. that all right? I think there was a lot of hype early on um, that distributed ledger technology was going to disintermediate custodians and we didn't need any more CSDs and banks were gonna be replaced by startups. But um, I think that was sort of the wrong or misguided focus and it's good to see that we're moving on from it a little bit because the, the, I think the, the reality is, is particularly to this space of financial services, we're talking about large financial institutions around the globe that are both heavily regulated and systemically consequential. And they're working with market participants whose activity and maybe the organizations themselves are also heavily regulated and systemically consequential. So the, the notion that um, a startup technology or a startup itself was going to begin to replace what um, had been long established norms and services. Um, it, you know, Tom was talking a little bit a moment ago about his services, not just simply agency services, but sometimes these organizations rise to the standard of having to provide fiduciary services as well. This isn't something that's going to be replaced by a, a technology. I think also, too, there was a lot of hype of um, we're going to move to a completely decentralized, distributed system overnight. Well, I mean, if that, too, is not, I think we might move there, but that, too, is not viable that it's going to have overnight. We're talking about um, established uh, 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 practices across legal agreements or across relationships and activity that are um, not business activities that are going to easily move or, or possibly move in an overnight basis. So, But what I like about what, what Alex said is I do think, though, that um, the, the advent of this technology is starting to cause shifts in the types of products and services that can be offered and who can offer them along the value chain. So when we look at it now, we see, and if you look almost everywhere around the globe, every um, a major market and major market player has some form of uh, new technology or distributed like technology or blockchain innovation. And I think part of that is because it's, it gives the opportunity to begin to mutualize infrastructure. And these are businesses that haven't previously had a whole lot of investment to make them operate more efficiently other than to sort of manage headcount, but to mutualize the infrastructure so that it, we can begin to have some of the benefits of cost reduction, um, greater risk control, uh, workflows that are now shared across participants. Um, I think also, too, this is beginning to translate into the opportunity to revolutionize how we think think about middle and back offices, not just simply for those cost and efficiency opportunities, but because that makes them more profitable and profitability leads to the ability to invest in new revenue generating activities. And then the last one, I think, too, is just practical. A number of the, the platforms around the world, um, certainly the case with ASX here, but elsewhere, we're talking about legacy platforms that have been around for decades. And so there's sort of this natural inflection moment where organizations can be looking at the type of technology and the type of services uh, on that technology that they might want for the next generation. So I think... Um, I think it's 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 just that it's just a, an inflection point in the industry where um, the benefit of a new asset class and the type of technology that may need to be needed to support it are causing um, paradigm shifts. Okay, so there was one thing that Alex said that that made my ears prick up, and that was you're describing this new world out there and cross jurisdictional, etc. And then you said there may not be assets we value, but does that mean that that world at the moment is basically a retail, it's a retail thing? Institutions, they, they may be interested in the technology, they may have innovation labs, and they may be doing various proofs of concept, but their engagement is limited. Is, what is gonna bring institutions to the table? Um, first of all, is that correct? I mean, our institutions are a little bit reticent still about engaging either with the technology in an investable way or in the assets. Well, yeah. the reason I talked about, you may not believe it. So, for instance, uh, kind of when I was running the UBS Innovation Lab, um, I had long arguments with Axel Weber, who came over to me, and he didn't believe in deflationary currencies. And that's fine. I think there is a room for deflationary currencies. 
So this is what I mean by belief. There is an underlying set of rules that govern the value of the system. You might not place value in it, mm -hmm. and I might do. That's a personal choice. What I'm prepared to pay for a car is not what you're probably prepared to pay for the car. So that's what I mean by that. Okay. In terms of institutionals, look, you know, individuals are always going to be able to per, you know, kind of invest in alternatives a lot more quickly than institutionals because, well, frankly, you don't have to go through 10 different governance committees before you can do something. So there's always going to be a faster movement at you know, individual high net worth, family office level, where you see majority of the movement towards the kind of the new asset classes, and only then, and then you get the hedge funds, and then you get the bigger institutional place, and that's natural. You know, I, I used to mentor a lot of fintech startups, and a lot of them would say, you know, you guys are old and stupid, and I said, well, m maybe, but let's do this. If you think your technology is good enough, bet all your grandma's money on it, but if you screw it up, uh, you have to look after mm. your grandma for the rest of her natural <coughs> life. All of a sudden, all of them wouldn't allow to do that because they were imagining having to look after her yeah. till 90. So we, we have a very different set of responsibilities. You can't do what you do as a startup, what you do when you're not a startup, and then you just got different responsibilities. So I think there is a lot of, like uh, Kelly was talking about, naivety uh, in the fintech space. Equally, I do think, you know, I often talk to executives around different banks and they've never heard of Bitcoin or Ethereum. They never heard of robo advisory and they never heard of crowd lending. And you kind of and they and they're kind of almost happy about it. I'm like, dude, you've missed out on the last 15 years of financial innovation. You're meant to be a thought leader. Are you that lazy and are you that disinterested in what you do day in, day out that you don't bother learning about it? Are you that arrogant that you think that nothing is going to change? So I do think there is a balance. You know, the, the naivety of the fintechs has to kind of reduce, but the curiosity of the so-called leaders of the financial world has to radically increase too. Tom, I, you, think, I mean, you've got financial institutions on your client base. What's their level of curiosity about this? Well, there's a huge amount of work going into it. And if you, if, uh, let me just go to step back again. Where we are today in sort of the traditional securities and payments world, there, everyone has duplicate infrastructures. We're all doing the same things. Our clients, the banks are doing the same things. To some extent, asset managers are doing it. We're doing it. And there's always this discussion about, can I outsource something to somebody else? By taking this technology, the opportunity is there to, as, as Kelly said, mutualize that investment and, and do it across a number of different providers. So the, the issue of outsourcing takes on a completely different character. So, and that's one of the huge opportunities in this, is that we don't have hundreds of islands of exactly duplicative activity, but unfortunately not exact because they're customized. And therefore, there's no standards in there, there's nothing. So you have all these extra costs that you could mutualize and take out. I think the issue of how quickly will it get taken up by institutions does, fortunately or unfortunately, relate to the issue of governance and regulation. And regulation is a double-edged sword. There, what is possible from a technology point of view in terms of, of what Ethereum is doing and what others are doing is not necessarily what is going to be acceptable for all of our pension schemes in terms of giving that level of comfort that the assets are there and that if my bank goes belly up or if something else uh, happens that I can get at those assets. So that governance element and to Alex's point earlier what the role of, a, of an infrastructure provider is and the various functions that we provide will undoubtedly change in the future. Mm -hmm. It won't be the same as today, but there is, to my mind at least, still a very valid role there in terms of translating what the regulations will require and to some extent they will probably be nationalistically oriented, unfortunately. I'd love to see a, 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 a pan-national exchange CSD capability, I don't think that's going to happen in my working life. Um, but is it, is it functionally doable? Absolutely. No question about it. 
Just one question before I, I open it up uh, for the first time. You, you mentioned regulation. Is there a discernible direction of travel of the various diverse regulators, or is it still a bit all over the place in terms of their attitude to this? Yeah, I think from, from our perspective, and we have the opportunity to be working with market infrastructure organizations in a couple of jurisdictions around the globe uh, who have a readily and ever-present regulatory interest uh, in, in what they're doing, if I say it that way. Um, what I, I think there's a tale of two cities, when it, uh, or a tale of two stories when it comes to this, in the sense that when, um, when it's organizations who are contemplating beyond the proof of concept stage to get to something that is going to support uh, a market, a systemically consequential market, a market that has real and sizable transaction volumes and throughput requirements, uh, and we could talk about that separately in a minute, um, is uh, it, 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 it necessarily and appropriately has the regulatory organizations, and I think the institutions, we're, at least we're working with, are inviting them to be part of it, because um, it, in my history, it's not been that regula regulators have looked to the technology to regulate, they look to what the technology does. Um, so uh, having them involved early, often, and a participant to a certain degree in the requirements has been, I think, beneficial for the organizations that we're working with. When I say it's sort of a tale of two cities, I think what's different, and what I haven't seen in um, in really prior years of my time in this in this industry is the degree to which regulators themselves are getting actively involved in uh, in um, testing thoughts and principles, even doing some proof of concepts directly. Like sandboxes. And that that's right. Yeah. That's a, actually. Yeah. Thank you. That's a better word. Um, uh, to so so not necessarily to implement, but I think to start to get some of the guide rails in place as to um, where the, uh, what, what these new technologies can do in order to enable better regulatory governance. Um, you know, and, and simply, and again, I'm representing the DLT side of things, uh, what, what this technology does, to the extent that a market operator will permission them to do so, uh, you know, a regulator can have a direct lens into the, the ledger and be able to extract real-time uh, governance quality data transaction, transaction, as it's happening. So the stacks of paper that we now have to deliver from a security services organization after the fact to a regulator who we need to compile them across the industry and, time to, and, and attempt to have some analytical guidance from that, that can now be driven by an app extracting the data directly from the ledger itself. And I think it's just a, a cleaner, different way of thinking about it. But we, 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 see, we see quite both going on, which is, I think, beneficial. There's an interesting angle is I hear this quite often the argument that blockchain is a nice way to data mine something. I think that's very unimaginative because actually what does a smart contract let you do? It allows you to make decisions based on the data. So instead of seeing blockchain as a data collection exercise that you then somehow separate from action on the data, we can actually put all the controls in the or reasonable number of deterministic controls in the blockchain. So, for instance, if you're starting to see a certain amount of volume that's exceeding, the smart contract that allows or disallows the transfer of an asset can simply not work anymore. I can create money that simply cannot be transferred to somebody in real time because a certain threshold's been kind of met. So, again, even the way that regulators are going to be operating is going okay. to change because what they will be doing is insisting that certain smart contract clauses are included into the asset. So they no longer have to even bother monitoring anything because they know that the execution is impossible uh, given the set of rules. Obviously, you still want to monitor it because there will be... I was going to say, trust is good, control is better. Absolutely. Right? Very Swiss. But the point is... No, no I agree. Oh, if you're Russian, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, uh, there, there's different ways of doing that. The point is the cost for regulators is going to be significantly cheaper because effectively most of it is going to be autopilot and what you're looking for is divergence from previous patterns and then uh, increasing and providing new regulation and new controls as you see new behavior happening. I think that's, why wouldn't you do that? Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, we're going to come on uh, in a minute to <clears throat> some concrete examples. Um, but before we do, is, are there any questions or comments on what you've heard so far? We'll, we'll, we'll have another opportunity. If uh, yeah, this one. Can you hold on to the mic? Because. Uh, And could you just say who you are and where you're from? Yeah, Chan Arambawala from the National Stock Exchange of Australia. Just probably a question for Kelly in the first instance. Also, I'd love to hear what the other panellists have to say. But in the context of the replacement of the chess system locally, mm -hmm. um, so the Australian market was dematerialised in 1992 uh, before chess was actually introduced as a system. So, in effect, we have a dematerialised market and that's what's been running um, ever since then. So from a digital asset perspective, surely this must be, you know, the best thing that could, could happen in terms of implementing DLT. You've got a de dematerialised market, you've got a dominant player in the market uh, owning and operating the infrastructure. So I'm just thinking, I mean, surely this must be the rails that you would really want in terms of implementing such technology. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly a good place to, to start. I mean, it absolutely was. But just taking a, a bit of a background or context for those of you not um, as familiar, in uh, 2015, ASX was contemplating the replacement of what was now a decade, couple of decades old uh, system for processing, clearing, and settlement known as CHESS. And that's, uh, that's what the gentleman was referring to. Um, and, and for those not as familiar, CHESS is the, uh, uh, the system that supports the core processing for clearing, settlement, asset registry, and a number of post-trade services that, you know, frankly are required for the orderly functioning of that market. And early on, they, uh, they took a look at and rec began to recognize the potential of distributed ledger technology, um, in part for its ability, and this was a high, this, to your point, this was a really well-functioning market to begin with, and they didn't necessarily have to replace Chase at the time, Chess at the time, but um, they were looking for what would be the next generation platform that would offer a, a couple of things among um, operating efficiency and um, certainly the ability to have uh, more uh, cost effective workflows with them and the market participants. But really, and, um, and if you, you listen to some of the folks from ASX that talk about it, what they are leaning more forward now on talking about is to have a platform from which new services and new products could be offered in a more cost-effective and a much more timely manner. Um, so, uh, so they embarked with us on a process to uh, develop, uh, test, and uh, implement a pre-production prototype that would be evaluated from both a functional and a non-functional perspective as to whether or not it could meet these, these market conditions. And again, um, they announced in December of last year that uh, the, the pre-production the pre prototype had met the rigorous qualities of regulatory and operating standards and would be replacing chess in 2021. But to get on the point um, early 2021, but to get on the point sort of very specifically, what, Chase, what, um, what ASX is doing is to begin to reimagine or um, uh, restructure in advance how clearing and settlement is done in that marketplace. No, they didn't invent clearing and settlement, but to really begin to, to transform how those services are done uh, in a couple of very important ways. One is, and you've heard um, uh, uh, Richard and Alex refer to this in some of their comments, one is it'll create that golden source of, of record, a single immutable data record that is um, uh, shared between ASX and the market participants. In and of itself, having this, this type of transparent, fully reconciled audit, audit trail created um, database is important, but, but more to the point, it will allow the market participants who are active in that network to begin developing applications uh, that extract that data and can be fed further from a straight through processing perspective into their own organizations. So to mutualize those workflows beyond just the confines of ASX itself, and now outwardly to the equity brokers, the local custodians, the global custodians. Um, it's also going to leverage, and I, I'll shamelessly say it, but I don't mean it from a sales perspective, digital assets modeling language, DAML, which is, going, is used to 
express the business rules and the, um, the business processes in a way that allow um, uh, uh, all of the organizations that are part of it to, um, to use that. But, but here's the important thing. It, the strict parameters of those shared workflows begin to eliminate, and I am going to use the word extreme, eliminate, um, the interpretation risk. So when you and I are doing a transaction, um, we now have no longer a different view on that. We don't have to reconcile it. And it's, there's no interpretation risk left. And it's not just for that moment in time that the cash equity trade is done. It is over the entire life cycle as you get into post-trade and post-settlement services. Um, and then, as I said, it's, you know, uh, they, they did this not simply to replace, but to grow. And so having a technology that gives innovation and extensibility unleashed in a web-paced way for that transfer of value, that's what, um, you know, I think that's what you will hear them talk about more. I, I will just say, if any of you are interested, and then I'll shut up, if you, any of you are interested in the ASX solution, they're demoing it at their booth um, during the course of these days, so you can actually see it play out live. So I, the very long-winded way of saying it, I don't, I think the market was operating pretty well, um, and the system didn't need to go away, but this is about giving a new platform, a new a plateau of a different level of platform that will compel this market forward um, for the next generation. So we, we focused so far a fair amount on the platform and, and infrastructure. Tom, am I right in thinking that um, SDX, the, the uh, digital exchange project uh, that SIX has, and is, I gather due to go live in 2019, in its initial stages, is looking is concerned not so much with the platform, but with the with but with the assets, with with making a, a safe home for digital asset investment, or is, am, I, am I misrepresenting it? I, I don't think you can phrase it that way because it's it's inextricably linked to the entire process of the trade, the settlement, and the and and the booking itself. Um, what we want to do is take that entire value chain and cover it off in one step. And, and, and back to the gentleman's question, I don't think it makes any difference, frankly, whether we're totally dematerialized now, which, which Switzerland is as well, or whether you're not. The tokenization process is one that you have to go through. You have to establish what the what, what the regulatory confines are around that and what the conditions will be. And that is the same amount of work whether you're going from paper or whether you're going from a, 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 an existing dematerialized digital ledger. I mean, in our local market, I think virtually every more sophisticated CSD is already in a position to be incredibly efficient. It's as soon as you go into the cross-border space, it gets much more difficult. It's getting the cash to the other places. It's mm -hmm. selling your securities in the United States and using the money from that to buy in Japan without having credit lines or collateral and all that stuff. And that's where the, 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 the benefits can start to be achieved, right? But we are efficient in our own little world. It's just that own little world isn't enough to provide real value into the market anymore because, again, we've got banks duplicating activities all over the place, CSDs duplicating activities all over the place, stock exchange du uh, duplicating activities all over the place. That just doesn't make any sense. So what are you actually looking to tokenize? Is it the, is it the assets that people invest in? Is it the, the method of payment for the, for the assets? Both. What? Both. Absolutely. I mean, there's... The, the issue of the cash side is absolutely critical to be able to maximize the liquidity in the system. Mm -hmm. And so you need to digitalize that in the same way that you do for the, for the assets. And those assets don't necessarily have to be existing securities. They can be anything, anything you add to it as well. What kind of assets are you looking to, to start with in, the, in STX? But to some extent, that depends on how far we get on the regulatory side. If we, if we can establish the regulatory status together with our regulators on the tokenization of existing securities, then we will lead with that. Otherwise, we will lead with ICO services and, and native tokens, which are 
which are issued on the exchange and will already be in a digital form. Alex, do you have anything you want to add at the stage? No, I think you hit on the right point. It's the, glo the global kind of angle. I think this is where the real need is to innovate. Um, and I think uh, kind of this is going to be the next challenge because when you're 30, it's, it's really difficult to understand right now why I can talk to somebody across the world and Skype uh, and I can't talk, uh, send money easily or buy securities. I was in Shanghai a couple of years ago, first time around for DEF CON 2. And yeah, I come from a banking background and there was a certain assumption that most kind of Bitcoin purchases or mm -hmm. token purchases were a little bit shady. Uh, so I started talking to a lot of uh, folks uh, out in Shanghai, you know, why are you buying this? And actually they said, look, we want to invest in American companies. There's no other way we can invest in an American company right now through normal channels. ICOs let me do that. They were looking for a global investment platform. And this is, this is the sea change. You know, it's kind of, everyone's still obsessed about the little national borders, but most millennials are like, this is my world. You know, I, I don't care about Germany. I don't care about it. I, I work around the world. I want to be able to invest in the best company wherever it happens. And this is just stupid. I mean. 30-year-olds look at it and go, this is stupid, <laughs> yeah? And this is it. So we start to see that this change, people are like, this is stupid. Uh, and you guys haven't shifted quickly enough, so we're creating a brand new system because, frankly, you're too slow. And this is, this is the paradigm shift. Mm. Any other questions at this stage? Um, you mentioned that people thought these transactions and cryptocurrencies, particularly Bitcoin, so there was something a little bit dodgy about that. And it strikes me that one thing that holding back institutions from engaging in this is <clears throat> perhaps the perception that AML and KYC and all the other things that they have to comply with is not rigorously handled in this world. Is that an issue? Or need it be an issue? Well, if you considered, you know, it depends how, there's a lot of, you know, one is, is it the bank's job to enforce uh, government's policy or not? And a lot of people on more libertarian side don't agree with anyway, because effectively much of law enforcement has been pushed out by the government to the banks. So that's, that's a philosophical question, kind of. Um, the second philosophical question, if we're really serious about uh, KYC ML, we'll ban cash. We'd also ban diamonds and art and many other as uh, kind of asset classes that are used to transport uh, kind of value across borders without necessarily the same level of checks. So we as a society have to be pretty honest about, you know, why do we tolerate certain amount of dark and gray matter and not others? So it's a philosophical question. And uh, kind of you can as easily, in fact, on Bitcoin, it's a heck of a lot easier to look at uh, money movements than pretty much on any other system. It's, everyone's got a copy of it. You might not know who it is, but you can look at patterns. Um, I think it's just something new. And people are always cautious about something new. That's about it, I think. And yeah. there's a lot of people who are in power, who are 55, and they're like, why should I take the risk? And I, I probably would do exactly the same. So I think it's just, it's part of it is just, uh, what's the upside of moving? You know, you're a big custodian bank, yeah? Um, you're gonna change. You're not maybe so technically advanced as the new start. So at best, you're gonna end up in the same place as you are at the top, having spent a lot of money. Why would you do that? So I think there's a natural kind of a new surge. This is nature. Older organizations die, new comes, comes in. It's just natural. We shouldn't be scared of it. Tom, think, but for you, it must be a practical question. This. Yeah, I think over the, over the very long term, that's, that's true. Uh, we don't have the luxury of, of being philosophers. And, and the reality is it'll be a step-by-step -step process that we get to. And, and to give the system credibility will require a degree of regulation. And most probably, with 99% certainty, that will be the existing organizations who are still required to do so. Mm -hmm. I don't know of any manager at a bank that I deal with, both institutionally, 
in business as well as privately, who is happy at having to deduct taxes and all that other stuff and be the tax collector. Yeah. None of us like it. But the reality is that's where the regulation is at the moment. And to give the, all the, the, the huge opportunities that we see in, in adopting the new technology with the changes that that requires in, in our infrastructures, um, using, using existing regulatory realities is just is, is a step in the right direction. And um, I think it needs that for the credibility. I totally agree. I mean, I'm implementing a <clears throat> what Fifth AML now calls custodial wallet provider. I'm baking in all the KYC. Of course, You've I'm going to be doing. Yeah. going to do that. So, absolutely, you have to live within the realities. So, I totally agree with that. Could I just uh, yeah, quickly, sure. for, and not at all to um, to uh, to detract from, but to add to what both Tom and Alex said, just simply from a technology perspective. Um, in distributed ledger technology, the smart contracts, what I was referring to before is the expression of the rights and obligations, the expression of the legal agreements. I mean, they're just an abstraction to the distributed ledger layer underneath. And they're, they're the expression of the, uh, the, the rule of law or um, the uh, governance rules around KYC, AML, cybersecurity, patriarch. You, could, you express those in a smart contract form. It's just so the reason I think that we in particular are spending so much time to make sure that the clients who are using our DA platform have the ability to uphold those rules, notwithstanding all of Alex's really valid points that over time I think this will this will um, maybe navigate away a bit, is for right now, as long as those smart contracts are an abstraction of what's down on the ledger, if you can't, or if you call into question what is expressed in a smart contract from a regulatory oversight or a rule of law or market rule perspective, then the data underneath and the contracts and the events that are being written to the ledger, the veracity of that themselves will be called into question. So necessarily from a technology perspective, we must work on a technology that can support the regulatory requirements that Tom is referring to right now, even though they might ultimately change over time. It's kind of, I think, a long way of saying, it doesn't really matter to us. We have to do it anyway, because it exists right now. Okay. So in the last few minutes, I, I'm gonna put you all on the spot a little bit. Um, with a D word, not data, but disintermediation, which rears its head every decade and at Cybos in some context. Who in this world, as it develops along the lines that you expect, who's going to be disintermediated? And if nobody is going to be disintermediated, then where are the savings going to come from? I think Alex's 55-year-old uh, example who is kind of coasting on I'm not his... saying how old I am. So, <laughs> yeah, well, I'm we're, not far we're off. We're leaving it right there. Um, who is coasting on the existing platforms and structures and, and systems in terms of how we interact with each other, um, they're going to have a serious problem. A serious problem. Because it'll go much, much faster, I think, than, than uh, most of us expect. Alex, do you agree with uh, that? Oh, I'm not picking 50. I, I, I know some 55-year-olds <laughs> that are damn smarter uh, than me and a lot more energetic. But you know, I'm kind of. I come from a banking world. I've done my own startup because I was frustrated that there seemed to be sometimes not enough pace in this yeah. space. Um, I think. <clears throat> is it? I, I don't. Give you a completely different example. I don't know exactly how the future looks, but I'll tell you how Tesla has solved win uh, wipers. Most people think of wipers as you put the uh, kind of toggle on it. They've done uh, what they've done is added artificial intelligence. So what they've done is when you move to make the thing move a little bit faster, they track it and they approve it. So I think the pace of change is so crazy. Nobody thought applying artificial intelligence to screen wipers would be something we would be doing. So I think it's impossible to predict what we will be looking like in 10 years' time. Um, but there are certain patterns we can start looking at. And this is uh, kind of creating artificial, uh, sorry, virtual agents escrow. So one of the blockchain things is the new thing about it is you can create a smart contract that has its own address, yeah? 
So now code kind of owns assets or at least holds them. It feels like this creation of virtual custodians, virtual escrow agents is pretty powerful because you can now create trust. The way I kind of look at it, um, we're moving away from mass production to mass customization. Today, most of the trust is mass produced. You have a current account, and that's what you get. If you want any kind of customization, that's about, you're not going to get some. With smart contracts and everything else, we're moving towards the world of mass customization. Uh, so intermediation will come back in, in terms of being able to code those customizations. Because as much as we like to tell, talk about uh, there is no intermediary, that's rubbish. Not everyone can code. So the new intermediaries are the ones who are creating the code. Uh, and actually, we will have to really much regulate them because mm -hmm. you have to really trust the code. So I think you're going to see all sorts of new processes focused on that provenance and the quality of code because code is going to be the thing that in practice going to enforce a lot of those rules. And if that's wrong, you will have massive systemic risk. So we have the risk right now of introducing not just flash crashes, but massively kind of a systemic uh, risk. And this is what we have to care for about. And, and people will need to, okay. regulators will need to understand that. Any questions? Final offer? No. OK, so to wrap up, mm -hmm. 10 years maybe, no one knows what's going to happen in 10 years, but from your own perspectives and what you are doing at the moment, either in terms of digital uh, ledger technology or uh, with digital assets, three years out, what would be your benchmark of success or failure? Shall I start? You start. Okay. 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 Well, we'll just go since we're, we're actually mandated to yeah. get stuff done in that time frame, uh, I, will say, I would say that, um, leaning on the success side, I would say that uh, a couple of things. One, to see production implementations of this technology and of the assets that can be supported through this technology, not just simply because of, not just simply against solutions that were about improving existing operating facility, uh, operating services or existing um, uh, workflows, not just simply on the same rails, but also to see it being used to produce new products and services that previously would have been impractical or possible to, impossible to achieve. I think, and this is gonna sound odd to say it, but um, I'd like to see the regulators involved. And the only reason I say that is because you know when the regulators get involved, it's serious. It's, it's, it's something that's there to last. Um, and I think in particular to this technology, um, to see it um, ever more in the hands of the actual developers themselves. I think we have institutions taking a look at it right now, but this is a, a, these are the types of technologies that come with software developer kits, so they can get into the hands of the individuals, and that just simply is the proverbial, more minds on it are better than one, and I think we start to see the proliferation of apps. What I really want to say, though, and, um, and, and this isn't so much a DA thing, because it's a Kelly Matheson thing. You know, I'd like to see that we have personal nodes on our mobiles and, and that it, we're starting to begin to manage our own um, a ledger of life events and information that's, that's personal to us. So uh, banking and financial services consolidated in one place. Uh, the purchases and sales of everything from household items to the households itself. Um, your medical records and your ability to affect insurance off of that. Your own personal node where it, we've gone from this environment of so much of our data going out to providers, so social networking and the like. I'd like to see that come back and have it be that we're now controlling and owning that own data on our own ledgers. And the truth of the matter is that might not be two or three years. But the thing of it is, is, is you know, in financial services, if you look at what we all do, it always begins with the big institutions starting to take a look at this technology look at new technologies, and then that proliferates among their market participants and the developers in those organizations and applications that move us forward get built. And so when I say this, it's not that we don't do it already because of lack of desire or purpose. We don't do it already because we haven't yet found a technology that provides an economical or secure way to do that. But distributed ledger technology overcomes those barriers. Tom? Alex and I are going to split the last 20 seconds. Yeah. Okay. Um, in three years' time, I'd, I'd like to see multiple installations 
um, at an infrastructure level that work and are interoperable with each other. Financial inclusion. As we lower the cost of transactions, we increase financial inclusion, which leads to greater wealth creation. And I think uh, that's something that is a worthwhile and noble goal. And on that note, for the last, I'll spend eight seconds saying thank you very much to the panel and uh, to the audience, and let's give the panel a round of applause.